All right, welcome to our unit on bonding. Today's topic is chemical bonds and electronegativity. Lesson one of three, your objectives are as follows. To review what a chemical bond is, to learn the difference between the three main types of chemical bonds and their physical properties, to learn how chemists use electronegativity values to predict bond type. All right, so for your quick write, in order to break chemical bonds, what do you think needs to happen? In table salt, sodium chloride, imagine you wanted to separate the sodium from the chlorine. How could you go about this? And then compare sodium chloride with carbon dioxide. How are these compounds different or how are they the same even? Okay, go ahead and pause this while you do your quick write. I'm going to move on. All right, so chemical bonds. A chemical bond is when two atoms share or transfer electrons. We will define a bond as a force that holds groups of two or more atoms together and makes them function as a unit. So when two hydrogen atoms, if they get close enough, okay, a bond may form. Okay, The result is a molecule of hydrogen gas, or H2, where the electrons are equally shared. Okay, So what is a chemical bond for your notes? Go ahead and pause this while you write. I'm going to move on. All right, so nonpolar covalent bonds. Nonpolar covalent bonding is the type of bonding in which electrons are equally shared. So let's consider our two hydrogen atoms again. All right. So notice the electrons are equally shared between the two hydrogen atoms. This results in a nonpolar covalent bonds. Okay. So in H2, and in most diatomic molecules, we have nonpolar covalent bonds where the electrons are equally shared. All right. Well, another type of bond that forms between atoms is a polar covalent bond. So a polar covalent bond is a type of bond where the electrons are not shared equally because one atom attracts them more strongly than the other. As a result, one side of the atom develops a partial negative charge and the other side, well, a partial positive side. Consider the molecule hydrogen fluoride here. Okay, notice how the electrons are shared unequally between the fluorine and hydrogen atoms. Okay, the fluorine has a lot more electrons around it. So this gives fluorine a slight negative charge and hydrogen here a slight positive charge. So that's a polar covalent bond where the electrons are not shared equally. Okay, and the last type of bond we're going to talk about are ionic bonds. So an ionic bond is a very strong bond that results in the complete transfer of electrons from one element to another element. For example, consider sodium fluoride here. Okay, so when sodium bonds with fluorine to make sodium fluoride, the electron is actually not shared but completely removed from the sodium atom over to the fluorine atom here. Okay, to make an ionic bond where the electrons are actually removed from one atom to the other atom, giving us an ionic bond. Okay? So, for your notes, what is the difference between a nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bond? Go ahead and pause this while you write. I want to move on. All right, so electronegativity. If you recall, in a polar covalent bond, electrons are not shared equally. In other words, one atom hogs the electrons. The unequal sharing of electrons between two atoms is described by a property called electronegativity. Okay, electronegativity is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. So in the case of hydrogen fluoride, fluorine is more electronegative because it attracts or hogs all the electrons. Okay, and as a result, the more electronegative atom Fluorine, in this case, takes on a slight negative charge, okay? Well, notice here on our periodic table, okay, elements in the top right corner of the periodic table, like fluorine, chlorine, and oxygen, have high electronegativities. They hog electrons, okay? And therefore, they have high electronegativity values. Well, elements in the bottom left of the periodic table, like cesium and barium, have low electronegativity values, okay? So electronegativity values for elements, in this case, range from 0.7 down here in cesium to all the way up to four, okay, for fluorine, all right? 
So for your notes, what is electronegativity? Go ahead and pause this while you write. I'm going to move on. All right, so using electronegativity to predict bond type. Notice on the diagram below, the left side represents a nonpolar covalent bond. The electronegativity values are less than 0.4. Okay, and as we move farther to the right, the next type of bond is polar covalent bond. The electronegativity values are between 0.4 and 2 here. And then on the far right here, okay, the bonds are ionic. The electronegativity values are greater than 2 here. All right. So, by comparing the electronegativity difference of two atoms, we can predict the type of bond between them. When there is little or no difference in electronegativity, the electrons are equally shared, and we get a nonpolar covalent bond. So, for example, hydrogen has an electronegativity value of 2.1. The bond that forms between H2, okay, two hydrogen atoms, has an electronegativity difference of 2.1 minus 2.1 gives us zero. Okay? So the electrons are equally shared to form a nonpolar covalent bond. So we're over here with zero. All right. As the difference in electronegativity changes, so does the bond type. For example, the bond between hydrogen fluoride here, H and F, has an electronegativity difference of 4 minus 2.1, giving us 1.9, which is just below 2. Okay, so this electronegativity difference tells us that the bond is polar covalent and the electrons are not equally shared. So we're here in the polar covalent range. All right. Finally, consider the bond between cesium and fluorine. So the difference is 4 minus 0.7, which is 3.3. So 3.3, well, this is the largest difference possible. So the bond is completely ionic. Okay, so the electrons are not shared at all, and the fluorine atom actually removes them, the more electronegative atom removes them from the cesium atom. Okay? So, for your notes, how do we use electronegativity to predict bond type? Question on the left-hand side, answer on the right-hand side. Go ahead and pause this while you're right. I'm going to move on. All right, so practice here. Use the electronegativity difference to identify the type of bond between the following. Nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, or ionic. Okay, so go ahead and pause this while you work on these questions one through three here. Determine the type of bond. Okay, go ahead and hit play when you're ready to check your work. All right, so let's see how you did. K and O. Well, subtract. Okay, 3.5 from oxygen, from potassium here, 0.8, it's 2.7, giving us, well, where's 2.7? An ionic bond. Carbon from carbon, the carbon bond. Well, what's 2.5 minus 2.5? That's zero, giving us a completely nonpolar covalent bond. And then finally, H and hydrogen and chlorine. Okay, well, 3.0 minus 2.1 gives us 0.9, which is a polar covalent bond. All right, hopefully you got those right. All right, covalent compounds. Consider the bond that forms between carbon and carbon and sugar. Okay, the covalent bond that forms between them creates a covalent compound. Recall that covalent compounds form between two non-metals. Okay, so carbon and carbon, right? Two non-metals. So notice the outer electrons are shared between the two carbon atoms. Okay, so the outer electrons here are actually shared between them. Okay, well sugar or glucose is an example of a covalent compound made up of mostly covalent bonds. Okay, so the sugar molecule here, okay, is an example of a covalent compound. Covalent compounds have physical properties. Okay, properties of covalent compounds include low melting points. Okay, they melt very easily. They do not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. An example, like I said, is glucose. Okay, so those are covalent compounds. And ionic compounds on the, are a little bit different here. So consider the strong bond that forms between sodium and chlorine. The ionic bond that forms between them creates an ionic compound. Okay. So recall that ionic compounds form between a metal and a non-metal. 
So notice how the electron is completely removed and transferred to the chloride ion. Sodium chloride is an example of an ionic compound. These ionic compounds have physical properties. Okay, just like covalent compounds, okay, ionic compounds have physical properties. Properties of ionic compounds include they have high melting points. It takes a lot of heat to melt them. They dissolve in water to conduct electricity. Okay, an example would be just sodium chloride or sodium fluoride. Okay, so what is the difference between ionic and covalent compounds? Question on the left-hand side, answer goes on the right-hand side. Go ahead and pause this while you write. I'm going to move on here. All right, so go ahead and summarize. You can always write your own. Okay, so go ahead and pause this while you write, and we'll see you next time.